Today, I got a lot of work ahead of me that I have been trying to put off for a very, very long time. So it makes no sense to you. It makes no sense to me. We're all lost at the same time. That's eight hours of doing this refactor. Oh my God. Yo, what's good everybody? Welcome to Building an App from Scratch, which is a video series where I document my process of building an app completely from scratch. And today, I got a lot of work ahead of me that I have been trying to put off for a very, very long time. It is something that has been living rent-free in the back of my mind that I've been trying to ignore forever, but it's come to the point where I can no longer ignore it. I have a gigantic refactor that I need to do. I played myself when I first built out this initial version of my app called perfectinterview.ai, which is an AI powered mock interviewing platform by writing absolute dog water, doggy doo doo spaghetti code that makes absolutely no sense. It's unreadable, hard to maintain, makes no sense. In the beginning when I first built out my app, I was like, eh, it's not a big deal. My biggest priority is just getting this app out as fast as I possibly can, which I did. But it has now come to the point where I am paying the price for that absolutely awful decision because I have to rewrite a huge portion of my app. I basically have to rewrite the entire database schema design of how my app stores certain parts of the data of my app and then, and then propagate those changes throughout the entire part of my app as well. It sucks, I hate it, but I have to do it. So rather than going through this miserable process by myself, I decided to document it and take you along with me. So let us dive into some of the details about what exactly I need to do during this refactor. So now let's go over to my laptop, show you what the old database schema looks like for storing the technical questions and how I plan to update it to be much more easily readable, much easier to work with just from an engineering perspective with a new updated design. All right, so before I get into going into the database schema design of how we store all the data, let me show you just exactly the feature that I'm trying to refactor. So right now, perfectinterview.ai is an AI powered mock interviewing tool. For the past couple of weeks, my co-founder and I have been focusing in on investment banking job interview prep because my co-founder is the marketing guy and he has an investment banking background. So that's the initial market that we're trying to go after right now. Right here, you can see we have these investment banking technical questions as well as investment banking Banking behavioral questions. So when we click on this right here, we are then taken to this question bank of a bunch of questions. So you can click on it and you can then answer everything here. You can view the solution as you go along. That's one way to solve the questions. This is kind of like the practice zone to practice answering these types of questions. But then there's a second way to go through these questions to test yourself on these questions, and that is with a mock interview, as you can see right here. With these mock interviews, the key difference is the fact that everything is recorded. We record the video of you answering that question. So when we click start right here, what kind of you hear the audio background going on in the background. But as you can see, I have this question, what kind of companies are good DCF candidates? I have no idea what that is. I'm a software engineer, but I would then answer this question by recording my answer. And then on the back end, we transcribe the video audio store the answer into text, and then the user can review their interview performance right here. You see the answer, and then we give feedback on the answer of how good or how bad it is. So that's kind of the general flow of how things work. And the key part to remember is the fact that we have all the questions stored, and the two ways that users can submit answers to these questions is via the practice question place and then via mock interviews, okay? So that's just a little bit of context. This right here is a system design of the legacy design of how we used to store all of the technical questions into our database that we are now about to refactor because it is awful. Even myself, the person that implemented this feature, I look at this and it makes absolutely no sense to me and it's always causing me trouble when I'm actually coding out these features. So let's get into it and let me show you how I wanna fix it up. So it all starts right here the investment banking technical question table. This is where every single question is stored. And then from here, we have the investment banking technical question answer table where we store the answer to every single question. And then also branching off of that table is the investment banking technical question submission table and connected to the submission table is the submission answer table. These two tables are primarily used in like the practice question bank zone where users can just practice the questions themselves and submit answers and see how they go. The technical question submission answer table has a reference answer ID and this reference answer ID right here refers to an answer in this table. So that's how we check for the answer correctness. And then we go over here you can see investment banking technical interview question. Um, okay, what exactly is that? It's so similar to investment banking technical question. Awful table naming. Caused me so much headache because they're so similar. The big difference is this is where we store users' answer submissions when they're answering the question in the context of a mock interview. This causes me so much confusion because when the question is a part of an interview, it has a separate ID. And instead, the question ID refers to this table right here. 
it may not sound like much, but it has caused me so much headache. I've probably lost like 10 to 12 engineering hours because I get these two IDs and these two tables mixed up all of the time. And then attached to this table, we have the technical question user answer table, which is just like the actual text answer to the question here. So it makes no sense to you. It makes no sense to me. We're all lost at the same time. So let me show you how I plan to update the design in a much better database schema design. And this is the new updated database schema that I want to add. And look at just how much simpler it is. Let's dive into it. So at the very top, we have a new investment banking interview entity. And from there, we have a list of questions that have a many to many relationship between questions and investment banking interview, because one question can appear on many investment banking interviews and many investment banking interviews can have multiple questions. So it's a many to many relationship. And then from these questions, we still have our existing answers table. So this is the actual answer key, the solution to every question that we store. And then remember how earlier my big pain point was how I store the submissions for the questions in an interview setting and then the submissions for the question in a like the practice zone setting. The way that I ended up solving it is really simple. I just created two completely separate tables that are also still linked to the same question. So every question entry has a list of submissions associated with it. So on the left hand side, we just have submissions and then submission answers because sometimes a question can have multiple answers. So this is just all of the submissions to a question in the practice question area and the question bank area. And then we just add the prefix of interview submissions and interview submission answers to let us know that these are submissions to the questions only when the question is part of an interview. And the big difference between these two tables is the fact that the interview submissions and the interview submission answers tables, they have a parent interview ID since they're always linked to some parent interview up here. And then we also have some additional fields to store the data, such as like the URL of the video recording, the transcript, as well as some other miscellaneous things for that as well. So that's the updated design. It's just so much cleaner and so much simpler compared to this whole, this behemoth right here. Oh my God, I don't even wanna look at it. So that's the updated schema. So now let's go over and build it out in real life. It is currently around 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning where I'm gonna start working on this and I think this is gonna be an all day endeavor. Hopefully this does not take too long. I'm gonna get out there. Hop on the old keyboard right here. Work some magic on these bad boys. Get this code written out. Hopefully, I don't spend my entire Sunday just working on this stupid annoying refactor and I can do some other things as well, like relax a little bit this weekend. Enough of me yapping, let's get into the building. As somebody that's been building out his own apps for the past two to two and a half years, I realized that 80% of the work that is done on these apps is really unsexy, really boring, stuff that users will never see, and a refactor like this is a great example of this. In the end, do the users care whether or not the database schema is really easy to work with? Hell no. But I've said this many times before, when you're building your own apps, one of the most important things that you can do is velocity. Ship fast, ship new features out really, really fast. And refactors like this, it's kind of important to help improve that developer velocity to help you code and ship new features a lot faster. But at the same time, it's a very big trade-off as well because by doing a refactor like this, which took me almost an entire Sunday, it also takes away time for me to be able to add net new features that users could want. It's definitely much more of an art rather than a science when trying to determine should you do a refactor and tackle some tech debt in your application or should you just ignore the tech debt and instead build out a new feature. It's something that I myself am still trying to figure out on how to make that decision and what's the right decision in most cases. Another topic that I wanted to talk about is I get a lot of questions about how do I get more experience doing these system design things? I'm sure there are products out there like system design interview prep stuff, but interview prepping versus actually building your app are such different things. If you wanna get better at these types of system designs or just designing your applications in general, not from like a UX design perspective, but more like an engineering design perspective, the best way to get better at it is just to build apps yourself. Trust me, those theoretical system design interviews are so different from actually implementing those changes in real life. But also let's say that you don't wanna go through the trouble of building your own application or trying to find users and all that stuff. Another great way is actually just contributing to open source projects. By contributing to a lot more open source projects, you can see how other projects are implementing certain things. So then you can implement it into your own projects or your own work 
later on in the future as well. And actually another great way is actually asking chat GPT for system design help. I actually think a lot of these generative AI models are really well trained in technical topics of software engineering. Oh, okay. It is currently around 4 p.m. right now. So that's eight hours of doing this refactor. Oh my God, kill me. I am glad that I finally got it done because I've been putting it off for so long and it finally got to the tipping point where I was like, dude, you got to do this or else you are just setting yourself up for even more pain in the future. So rip the bandaid off, get the refactor done now. I wanted to show you the results of the refactor, but the thing is, there's no visible UI change. It looks exactly the same to the user. So there's no cool like, whoa, before and after I can show you. It's just exactly the same. There's there's no difference on the outside. That sucks, but that's the reality of building products. Sometimes you do things where everybody can see your hot, sexy new feature, but probably 80% of the work that you actually do is stuff that nobody will ever be able to actually see. Sometimes I wonder why I ever decided to pursue this dream, but if I'm being honest with myself, it's because I love it. Thanks for watching today's video and make sure to hit the subscribe button if you want to see more of my journey building out my own product. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.